Good afternoon and welcome to the Acton Institute. We are delighted to collaborate with the Austrian Economic Center to co-host today's Free Market Roadshow. The Free Market Roadshow partners with leading think tanks, scholars, business professionals, and policy experts to discuss solutions to some of the most pressing issues of the day, such as cost of living, individual freedom, democracy, government debt, and much, much more. The goal of the Free Market Roadshow is to illuminate the importance of the free and responsible individual to securing our prosperity. The Free Market Roadshow has held lectures and panel discussions in dozens of cities all over Europe, as well as additional conferences in the United States and Latin America. The Acton Institute is delighted to host FMRS as part of their tour of American colleges and institutes this month. Today's format consists of two one-hour panels with a 30-minute break in between. Dr. David Hebert moderates our first panel, and he will discuss the topic of unrestrained government spending and economic prosperity with Barbara Colm and Dan Mitchell. The second panel will be moderated by Eric Cohn, who will discuss the topic of unleashing the entrepreneur with John Chisholm and Dylan Pommen. Throughout each panel, we invite you to submit your questions to our virtual platform at slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O dot com, and use the code F-M-R-S, that is Free Market Roadshow, F-M-R-S. So welcome to our first panel, and we welcome both in-person participants as well as those online. And now let me hand it off to David Hebert. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, as Dr. Barrow said, my name is Dave Hebert. I am an associate professor of economics here in town at Aquinas College. I'm joined by Dr. Barbara Kolm, who is the vice president of the Austrian Central Bank, the director of the Austrian Economic Center, the president of the Hayek Institute, and professor at the University of Donha Gorica. Close. Donia Gorica. There we are. <laughs> uh, and to my immediate right is Dr. Daniel Mitchell. He is a public policy economist in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was a former senior fellow with the Cato Institute, the former economist with the Heritage Foundation, the former director of tax and budget policy for citizens for a sound economy. He co-founded the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, and he is a leading expert in the field on the flat tax and the importance of international tax competition. Uh, so it's wonderful to be, to be joined by such qualified people. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Barrow said, my job here is to facilitate a discussion between these two uh, incredibly intelligent people. Uh, so I want to kick us off with, with one question to kind of begin with. So we're taught in, in Econ 101, for example, uh, that spending is what drives the economy, that more spending is a good thing, that less spending would be a bad thing. So what I want to ask you both is, to what extent is this true? And I'll start with uh, Dr. Colm. Okay. Well, it depends who is spending. If it's the individual, that's wonderful. If it's, uh, to make it simple, if it's the government, it's our individual's money. And the question is, is it being spent wisely or not? Is it being spent frugal or not? And actually, is it spent for things that the citizen, that the individual needs or not? And if we have answered those questions, then we should continue. But after all, you know, Little government is always better than big government, and big government means big spending, and we don't want taxpayers' money to be used, uh, abused. The uh, the whole argument on, beha on behalf of spending driving the economy, that's a Keynesian construct. Uh, now, oftentimes, as Barbara just said, it's in the context of, oh, the economy is not strong enough. We need government to spend money to prime the pump. But, but Keynesians also think that consumer spending is a driver of the economy. You see these reports about what happened to consumer spending last month or last quarter, uh, and oh, was Black Friday strong enough uh, to help the economy? That's wrong. What drives the economy is income and production, which is driven by saving and investing. Consumer spending is a function of a strong economy. It's not the driver of the strong economy. You have to put the cart and the horse in the right order, uh, and obviously, 
echoing what Barbara said, the idea that government's going to somehow borrow money out of the private sector and spend it, the notion that that's going to somehow give us more economic efficiency or growth is theoretically wrong, but probably more importantly and more compelling to people. Let's just look through history where we've had Keynesian so-called stimulus plans. Hoover and Roosevelt in the 30s didn't work. Uh, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter tried it with their rebates and Keynesian gimmicks uh, in the 70s, didn't work. Uh, Bill Clinton had his little stimulus in 1993, that didn't work. Uh, we had a stimulus under Bush in 2008, didn't work. We had another one under Obama in 2009, one under, under Biden in 2021. None of these Keynesian stimulus work because you don't make yourself richer by taking money out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket. Please. Let me add to that, because you just meant, and there would be plenty of examples in Europe as well, but you mentioned two things, um, saving and productivity. And I think those are the key players that we, need to, uh, that we need to go back to if we want economic growth. Individuals need to be able to save, and also uh, our labor market needs to be productive. And that's what we have totally lost over the past decades, at least in Europe and uh, in the US, I think the same thing is true. Yeah, it's always been pretty interesting to me when we see saving in the economy as viewed as non-spending. But of course, the money has to go somewhere, which means it is spent in one form or another. Can you perhaps comment on uh, the importance, and I guess emphasize the importance of, I'm sorry, of saving and further investment toward developing human prosperity? Well, don't forget that saving and investing are different sides of the same coin. So when you're saving, you're investing. When you're investing, you're obviously utilizing savings. And every economic theory, this is what really gets me about the Keynesians, every economic theory, including the Keynesians, will agree that long-run growth is a function of saving and investing. Now, some theories like socialism and Marxism, they think government can do the investing. That's a little bit silly. But there's literally not an economic theory that I'm aware of that doesn't, is not based on the idea that saving and investing, setting aside some of today's income, is necessary to finance tomorrow's growth. Uh, but the Keynesians say, well, that's the long run issue. Sometimes you have this short run demand, demand management uh, situation where the government has to come in and, and prime the pump. I will say there is one tiny way in which I think the Keynesians maybe get it one third of the way right. If you wind up doing a Biden type stimulus plan and you're going to spend, one, I think it was $1.9 trillion, if you borrow a lot of that money from overseas, you can artificially goose your consumption in the short run. Now, you're doing it at the expense of having to pay off foreign bondholders in the long run. So it's sort of like thinking that you're increasing your, your family's living standards by breaking into the kid's college fund and then having a weekend in Las Vegas or something like that. Right. So, so it doesn't make sense. But yes, in the short run, you can artificially make it seem like you're more prosperous. But that's especially the thing in, in Europe. Uh, all our politicians keep forgetting when they use Keynesian politics that in eventually, you know, the money that is spent needs to be paid back. And what we've seen these days, we are building piles and piles of public debt. And uh, they will obviously not be paid by this generation nor by the next, but maybe by the third or fourth generation, if at all. And this is a huge problem. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, so would you say, in, in your opinions, that government spending thus far or in its current form today has perhaps gone too far down this Keynesian rabbit hole of celebrating spending at the expense of perhaps investment? My concern is not so much the Keynesian stuff, because that, that's, that's like a, a one-time injection of spending for different constituencies of Washington. Uh, and it's bad. I disagree with those things but our much more fundamental spending problem in the United States, and for that matter in Western Europe, is just the long run trend line of government consuming an ever larger share of the economy. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, you have governments where literally it's more than accounting for more than 50% of GDP. We're lucky, quote unquote, in America, we're in the upper 30s as a share of GDP. Now, obviously, you had this short run coronavirus uh, spending that a lot of governments do. So you sort of want to, hopefully, that was all one time spending. But some of it will get built in what's, into what's called the baseline. But, but here's the challenge. We're getting older as a society. And 
we're having fewer children as a society. And when you have entitlement programs based on a population pyramid, a few old people, lots of workers, then an even bigger generation of children, as those population uh, pyramids turn into population cylinders, living longer, fewer kids, these Ponzi schemes become fundamentally unworkable. And that's why you're seeing riots in France. Macron, who's no free market guy, he, even he realizes, well, we can't have people retiring at age 62. And of course, you know, we're in the process of adjusting our retirement age to 67, but we still have these multi-hundred trillion dollar unfunded liabilities because of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. That, to me, that's the giant problem. The Keynesian spending is almost like a mosquito bite by comparison. And in addition to that, there is a basic question, what is the task of government? We've, we've gr grown the task of government you know, from cradle to grave these days. And this is what needs to be reduced and where we critically need to ask rule of law and then what else? Security and then maybe education, maybe what else? But you know, in the end, make people understand that it's their own money that is being spent by the government. And that's, I think, um, one of our major tasks to make sure. And coming back to the so-called pension bomb, um, pension, the pension system and the social security system has not been changed, at least not in Europe, over the last 30 years. And uh, our, as, as in the US, our labor market is totally dried out. There are no people who are productive. There is a life-work balance, and it's more life-life-life work balance, and that will become a, an even bigger issue. And COVID, with all the incentives that have been provided by government, has just fueled into that and added into this uh, negative spiral that we see these days. So you raise a, a point that I wanted to, to get to today. So national governments around the world, I, I don't think it's a secret to either of you or to anyone in the audience that, that governments around the world are facing persistent deficits every year and growing and mounting national debts. And, and from a, a, an accounting perspective, this is a relatively simple thing, right? If you have a debt, you either reduce spending or you increase revenue, right? And, and so I'm curious to ask, in, in your opinions, is, is the persistent debt that we see in democracies, frankly, around the world, is this a function of too much spending, too little revenue, perhaps too much responsibility, or something else? First, for example, in Austria, it's both end. We have much spending, plus we in, uh, have more revenues by the enterprises uh, in, in form of corporate tax coming in, which is being spent, but not wisely spent. So it's both end in Europe. Okay. My view is that deficits and debt are symptoms. The underlying disease is government spending. If we took the current size of government, which is well over $6 trillion now, annual budget in Washington, and we took that deficit and said, okay, we're gonna replace all that deficit finance government with new tax finance government, would we be any better off? Government would still be diverting the same amount of resources from the productive sector of the economy, it's just they would be doing it, financing it with taxes instead of borrowing. So, so I don't view deficits as the problem to solve, I view excessive government spending as the problem to solve. But that's only part of the story. The history in Washington is very, very clear. If you increase taxes, what do they do? Do they use the money for deficit reduction? They never do. They use it to finance more spending, and then the deficit winds up even higher. And I actually did the data on the European Union. I looked at the old EU 15, the Western European countries. You go back to the mid-1960s, uh, you know, the last five years of that decade, you look at government revenue as a share of GDP and look at where it is now, basically because of the, the uh, addition of value-added taxes and things like that, the tax burden in Europe has gone up by more than 10 percentage points of GDP. What's happened to government debt during that period? It's gone up even faster. In other words, they have literally spent every single penny of this giant tax increase and then some. The idea that you're going to get politicians to balance the budget by giving them more revenue, of course that's not going to work. They are going to spend the money. Yeah, there has been, wasn't there a president in the U.S. who said one has to starve the beast? 
Well, that, that was the that was the uh, the view of cynics of the Reagan tax cuts. Yeah. They said, "Oh, Reagan wants to starve the beast." Well, I do want to starve the beast. There's no yeah. question about it. And interestingly, a lot of people say the starve the beast theory is discredited. And there was this famous Romer and Romer paper on the issue. I actually read the paper, and you know what they said? Tax cuts don't work to constrain spending because, on average, within five years, the tax cuts are taken back with tax increases. Yeah. So it's sort of like saying diets don't work if you're having chocolate cake every night. Yeah. But wow, what a, what a revelation. And, and another good example is the Maastricht criteria in Europe, since you mentioned uh, the European uh, countries. Uh, we have broken them ever since. And actually, the Germans were the first ones to exceed, of, exceed the 60% at uh, GDP level. and uh, Ever since, the French continued. And then after the big financial crisis, you have heard of all the bailouts and Greece and Spain yeah. and Portugal and the rest. And now we are still we are having the same problem. And after COVID, it's even worse because the bailouts we have seen back then in 2012 are just many, we have many bailouts in contrast or in comparison to what we see after the COVID bailouts. There are additional zeros to yeah. that. It reminds me of uh, the quip, you know, do you know the difference between a trillion dollars and a billion dollars? Right, well, it's about a trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've sort of lost sight of how big these numbers truly are. Uh, but you bring up the, the starving of the beast quote, and I, I think it's a wonderful quote. Uh, and what I want to kind of ask you both about is, do you think it's important to starve the beast of, of resources in the way that Reagan and, and his people were sort of accused of doing? Or is there a different tack that could be taken, perhaps, in starving the beast of responsibility and then allowing sort of the tax burden to fall from there? Actually, that was what, what I was going to direct the, the, the discussion to. I mean, supply-side economics allow the enterprises to provide the right solutions and not, uh, not have government impose the solutions or tell them to do that and try it and experiment with our money, but let enterprises provide uh, solutions to whatever issues we have coming up. And then again, um, Government should stay, should take not at least one step, but many steps back and ask, do we really have to provide this service on the one hand? And is this regulation really necessary? I mean, this uh, two in, one out is not enough. You need, uh, if you get one new regulation in, you need to take 10 out right. in order to be flexible, in order to be compatible. And that's a thing we need. Our, our uh, countries, our nations need to be compatible um, because where do the new G7 stand? Who is competing with us? It's, uh, it's India, it's Asia, it's, it's economies who have less spending issues than we have. And uh, there we should look. I agree with Milton Friedman. I'm in favor of any tax cut for any reason at any time. Having said that, I just cited the Romer and Romer study on starving the beast, which it doesn't work in the long run to constrain government because governments will then come back in and raise taxes to make up for the tax cuts. I think America's founding fathers actually had the best idea. They set up a constitution, if you look at Article 1, Section 8, that delineates some very narrow and limited powers for the central government. Unfortunately, beginning in the 1930s, our Supreme Court basically fell down on the job in terms of upholding those limits on the powers of the central government in Washington. And ever since then, it's basically whatever Washington wants to do, even with the, the infamous Roberts decision on Obamacare, yes, they can force you to buy a, uh, an allegedly private product, health insurance, uh, using some vague powers of interstate commerce. And of course, the interstate commerce clause was put to stop states from having protectionism between each other, and the courts have turned it upside down and used it as just carte blanche to let the Washington do whatever it wants. Yeah, I agree. It's been, it's been a fun 10 years or so. Yes. <laughs> uh, so one question I, I have. So you mentioned this idea of, of governments going into debt, you know, buying things and taking money from one pocket and putting it in the other. And, and that's, that's great. I, I agree with those analogies. But surely we can imagine scenarios where uh, we could think instead of about taking 
money from one pocket and moving into another. Perhaps I can borrow money from the future. So, you know, I have a mortgage, for example. I am borrowing against my future stream of income. Could you think of any instances where it might make sense to borrow money from a future generation to spend today that might provide a stream of services over time that might be worth it? Well, World War II. I mean, I, I am not an anti-deficit uh, uh, phobe. Uh, or a debt phobe, I guess you would call it. Uh, if if they if the government, uh, say the city of Grand Rapids, is borrowing some money because they're modernizing their sewage treatment plant or something like that, that's something that has benefits over a generation or two. By all means, if you want to borrow to do that, the problem with politicians is that you can't trust them to limit their borrowing to things that have genuine multi-generational benefits. Instead, they borrow money to finance current consumption. So if you're borrowing a lot of money like they are in Washington just to finance the general budget of redistribution and vote buying, that's a lot different than borrowing money for the sewage treatment plant or to win a world war. Yeah. Or build a bridge. Or build a bridge. In addition, I think we should look into the differences if it's on the local, on the regional, or on the national level, or in the case of Europe, supranational level, when, for example, uh, the Austrians pay for infrastructure pro uh, projects in, you name it, Portugal mm -hmm. or elsewhere. And so those are the things where we actually need to look into exactly. So Barbara, you mentioned uh, a great distinction. You know, we're, we're talking about government in the abstract, but there are subnational, local, regional, perhaps in some instances, national, supranational. There are all sorts of levels to this. Uh, and so one question I, I always kind of think about is, is, is the problem with government spending a disconnect between what the citizens want versus what they get. And I'll, I'll give an example from my own life. So I live you know, here in town in East Grand Rapids. Uh, we pay quite high property taxes relative to everyone else in this area. But for those additional taxes, there is a uh, plow that comes by and plows the sidewalks every single morning in the winter, right? So the children don't have to walk to school in the snow, right? It's still uphill both ways. They still have shoes on their feet, supposedly, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, they don't have to walk in the snow like their forefathers did. Um, and that one, that millage, you know, always gets near unanimous support. So can we think about where is the problem, like, at what point does it become a disconnect between what citizens want and what they get? I think the more direct the democracy is, the better it is. In other words, look at the Swiss example. Here, people literally vote with their feet, move from one canton to the next one if they don't like the service that is being provided or whether snow plowing in Switzerland, which is also important, right. is for example in Canton X way too expensive because they run it inefficiently, whereas in Canton Y it's much cheaper and so they, they prefer it there. Or differently, the citizens organize it among each other and do it privately. So that's another option for Switzerland. So I think the more direct democracy is, the, more, the closer the citizen to the politician is, the easier a solution is. The bigger the distance is, say from Santa Barbara to Washington, Santa Barbara, California to Washington, the long distance. Um, also from my hometown Innsbruck to Brussels is a long distance, whereas um, th those things need to be taken into consideration. So I love the Swiss model with this direct democracy and, and uh, voting with your own feet. I like the Swiss model too, in part because I trust the Swiss to be sensible. Would di direct democracy work very well in Greece? They would simply vote themselves other people's money until, as Margaret Thatcher famously said, you run out of it. I think what's really key, the thing I really like the most about the Swiss model, is decentralization. It is, it is what the United States used to be. We used to have two-thirds of government taking place at the state and local level in the US, just like they still do in Switzerland. Unfortunately, we've had more centralization and more centralization uh, starting in the 1930s. So now, state and local governments, yeah, they do have some powers, and it's great to see that you have zero income tax states attracting jobs and investment from high tax states like, uh, like New York and California. Uh, but 
boy, would it be great to get rid of all that additional spending and an intervention by the federal government and go back to the decentralized system that our founding fathers had in mind. That, I think, is what makes Switzerland so successful. Plus, let's not forget this. Barbara mentioned the Maastricht criteria. Uh, these are rules governed, uh, dictated by the European Union that allegedly limit deficits to 3% of GDP and debt to 60% of GDP. That's focusing on the symptom. The underlying problem, as I already said, is government spending. What do the Swiss have? They have something called the debt break, but it's really a spending cap. So ever since Swiss voters, by almost 85%, voted in that spending cap in 2001, government spending on average in Switzerland has only grown 2.2% a year. Over that same time period, in America, it's grown about three times as fast. If we had had a spending cap like the Swiss, we would not have our current fiscal problem. So controlling spending, a fiscal rule, I mean, your dissertation was on James Buchanan. Yeah. I mean, James Buchanan is looking down on Switzerland right now and saying, that's what we need in the United States. Barbara. There is also something that I would like to add, the te terminus technicus, uh, namely the subsidiarity principle. So if things can be done on a local level more efficiently than they should be done on a local level, there is no need to go up to the regional or the national or even the supranational level. And that's what our politicians have constantly forgotten, because they rather delegate it too far away instead of solving the issue right away with their own citizens at the same at the spot. Yeah, can you comment on, on what has perhaps led to that? Because you would think that local politicians would want to zealously guard the power to do things and would prevent you know national governments from doing things on their behalf. But what we see the opposite in the US and I know in Western Europe as well. So what what do you think has led to that? I think it's just politics. Uh, if you can get a benefit and have somebody else pay for it, and, and, and that's the great fiction of Washington. You collect the money through the IRS at the state level, you put it in a leaky bucket, you carry it to Washington with some spilling out, then you have a bunch of bureaucrats in Washington that chew up some of what's in the bucket, and then you send it back out to people you know, in grants to individuals or to states in the same leaky bucket. Now, that doesn't make sense. We all lose on net. But if you're a politician in Congress, well, you're going to buy votes by convincing people you'll get more from the leaky bucket than you pay into the leaky bucket. And of course, on net, that doesn't, that doesn't work. But people live under, to cite James Buchanan again, yeah. fiscal illusion. Yeah, this is what Jim Buchanan told us. Right. Public choice. That's it, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> So <clears throat> it's humane. It is right. Uh, so Adam Smith, you know, famously described a, a juggling trick among politicians of deficits, debasement, and, uh, and what was the third? I forgot the third. Deficit, debt, and debasement. I think was the third. Right. So okay. the idea, right, is if you could uh, borrow the money to spend it, right, or you could tax people, or you could simply debase the currency through inflation, right, and. One question that, that kind of remains is, is given that we have sort of the power to tax, the power to spend, and the power to print money, do those three powers vested in one entity that we could call government, does that reinforce sort of the problems with each three, or does it help mitigate it, or what, what would you say? Well, first of all, I would say, I would argue that monetary policy has to be kept strictly separate from fiscal policy. And this has not happened over the past years, at least not in Europe. So we have had a very strong connection between Brussels and Frankfurt. And uh, this definitely was not the right thing. Barbara has to be very polite because she is a central banker and she can't, she can't talk out of school, but I will. <laughs> Thank the you. European Central Bank is basically financing all of Italy's debt. That's in part what has contributed to the inflation in, the, in Europe. And we've, of course, made the same mistake in the US, not because we're financed. I mean, we did our big money printing, figuratively speaking, in 2020 and 2021, and initially triggered by the pandemic. Central bankers panicked. 2008, there's a national crisis. And so they sort of, they sort of buying up lots of government bonds, expanding their balance sheet, as it's called. I can sort of understand why they did that in March of 2020. But by September of 2020, why were they still doing it? By March of 2021, why were they still doing it? 
by September of 2021? Why were they still doing it? And of course, eventually, expanding the balance sheet by $4 trillion caught up to them, and we wound up having inflation in 2022. And inflation in terms of rising consumer prices, as opposed to the inflation of the money supply in the first place. And, and the European Central Bank, they expanded their balance sheet by about the same amount. You can't create that much money uh, without causing problems. Now, the interesting question is, why are different central banks expanding their balance sheets? In Zimbabwe and Argentina, they print money to finance their budget. In the US, I think we mostly make that mistake for Keynesian reasons. Let's just artificially lower interest rates. In Europe, did they do it for Keynesian reasons, or did they do it to prop up Italy by buying all their dodgy government debt? You probably I'm, can't answer. I'm, I'm not answering this, but I would like to also point another, uh, make another point. Uh, not only that the inflation sparks had been there already in 2018, when we were discussing uh, greening the economy and uh, when you know when we had supply chain issues already, even before COVID, before we had all those lockdowns and price, uh, the price um, mechanisms had been, you know, got, had not functioned anymore, put it simply as it was. And so this was already the case in 2018 and nobody realized it. And then, you know, all the lagging behind, all of a sudden here is inflation. And then people thought, oh, it's transitory. Come on. No, it's not. Um, and and that's, that's a big issue now because after three external shocks, or actually four external shocks, including the war um, in Ukraine, then, then you really have an issue and you can't price it in anymore. And you know, reducing the balance sheet of the central bank slowly is only one thing but it will take another time, uh, lots more time to balance it out and come back to the 2% threshold of inflation that we have kind of um, agreed on commonly. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned the, the massive increase in the balance sheet. The latest figure I saw for the US is something to the effect of an 88% increase in the monetary base just over COVID, right? which is staggeringly fast. It's nearly double. Uh, and so high inflation in, in that environment is frankly, not surprising. Would you both agree? I would agree, but, but here's the challenge. People like us have been the boy who cried wolf, because going all the way back to Obama stimulus, uh, the Fed has basically kept interest rates artificially low for a long time, and we've been saying, inflation's coming, inflation's coming. Well, 2013, 2014, mm -hmm. 2015. Mm -hmm. Now, the so there was an excuse. We weren't necessarily wrong, because sometimes when you create excess liquidity, it goes into asset prices. It props up financial markets instead of going into higher consumer prices. But because people like us were saying, you know, the version of the British are coming and the British never came, uh, it did look like, well, were we wrong? No, we weren't wrong. It's just it took a while for it to hit consumer prices because of that massive uh, expansion. Whether you measure the monetary base or whether you measure the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, they basically are a very similar measure. I like the balance sheet because it's so easy to measure. People argue all the time, well, what's the right definition of money anymore? Well, whatever. Look at the balance sheet because that's obviously new liquidity being put in the system. So I've always preferred that measure. But you know, as I said, we have. I don't know that this is a mea culpa as much as it's just monetary policy is not quite as cut and dried as we think. And it did take a long time for the for 1970 style inflation to come back because that's what people thought when we were complaining about the Fed's policy 10 years ago. Well, one could also say that we probably have looked much closer into the boom and bust cycles that were described by Hayek and Mises in the 1920s. And then, you know, they also foresaw the, the, the busts that had happened uh, in the 70s and as oil crisis, dot-com bubble, etc. So that's just reality. That's, um, that will, that's a logic consequence of, 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 the, of what has happened. No, I agree. It's, it's, we are a bit of a, the boy who cried wolf. We do have that problem. I think we've successfully predicted 13 of the last three recessions, which is uh, always a fun statistic, right? Especially as economists when oh, we're and, always... And, and, and there are people on our side uh, you know, who say the end is coming because of all these entitlements and spending and debt. Right. Well, in reality, 
we probably have at least 20 years, if not more, where we can continue down this path. Why? Because the U.S. is an international safe haven. France is going to blow up before the United States. <laughs> Japan's going to blow up before the United States. Italy, as soon as the ECB stops propping up their government bond market, is going to blow up. So, so we, un in some sense, being the world's reserve currency, which is a technical boring issue we don't need to get into here, we have a lot of time uh, before all our mistakes catch up to us, which in some sense is bad because it's usually only when there's a crisis that politicians act. Of course, Robert Higgs tells us when there's a crisis, politicians use that to make government bigger. So I don't know that we actually want the crisis. Uh, it just shows that we're... You well, know, how big do you want it right. to be? <laughs> yeah. I mean... Yeah, no, the, the, the longer you wait to solve a problem, the bigger the crisis there will be, but then maybe the bigger the bad policy that will get enacted. It's true, very true. So I want to ask a, a separate question. Uh, so what, in your mind, is, is the real danger of, of public debt? Right? It, clearly, it's, it's big. It's a big, scary number. Uh, you can go to you know, debtclock.com and see it grow every single second. Uh, but that's just a number on a screen. How does it affect everyday people you know, as they're living, living their lives and going about their days? People becoming irresponsible, not understanding where money comes from, how to earn it, how to manage it, how to save it. And uh, that, I think, is, is the biggest danger if we just kick the can down the road on, for a while. We want individuals to think and act and make their own decisions and not rely on others, on, on handouts or on other people's decisions. I agree with Barbara that, that there really is a moral component to all this. A society where people think they can live off others and should live off others probably is heading in the wrong direction. But I want to say something uncharacteristically optimistic. If you go back to the end of World War II, our government debt had shot up to, I think, 116% of GDP. From 1945 until, like, you know, 1970, we didn't reduce our government debt at all. It actually crept up a little bit in nominal terms. But government debt as a share of the economy, as a share of gross domestic product, fell dramatically. Think of it like you're a household. You're just out of college. Uh, you, know, you got some entry-level job, and you have $20,000 of credit card debt. That's a major problem you have. On the other hand, you're 58. You're at the peak of your career. You have $20,000 of credit card debt, but it's largely irrelevant to you. In other words, you do want to measure your government debt as a share of the economy. And so as long as you have your income growing faster than your debt, just like if your national income grows faster than your government spending and government spending falls as a share of GDP, that's progress. So it's not like we have to do something heroic. We simply have to make sure that we're vaguely halfway responsible so that we're letting the private sector grow faster than the government, either the spending burden or the debt burden. Uh, because as I said already, I care a lot more about government spending. Tax finance spending is bad. Money printing finance spending is bad. And so is debt finance spending. I'll close with one other thing. This is good news, but bad news. Government debt as a share of GDP has actually fallen recently. Why? Because of inflation. <laughs> inflation reduces the value of all the outstanding government debt. So our government debt as a share of GDP, if you look at a chart, suddenly took a little plunge. But is it good that we're, in effect, stealing from bondholders by devaluing their existing assets? That's obviously not the right way to make progress uh, in terms of reducing government debt as a share of GDP. Yeah. Go ahead. There is also one other thing that you should look into. Being, com as I mentioned before, being competitive and productive. Mm -hmm. I think we need our societies to reconsider that, because otherwise the West will not look good in the future. Yeah, you know, Dan, you, you mentioned an important thing that I, I think is often misunderstood is there's a story behind all these numbers, you know, debt to GDP ratios. Those can fall and it's not necessarily for good reason. And so the important thing is, is to me is to understand why these things are falling and what's causing these things to go down. Same with unemployment rates, all these other you know, rates that we look at. Uh, these changes, they can be good or bad, up and down, you know, maybe not sideways, but uh, all kinds of directions can be good uh, or they can be bad. One thing that, that you mentioned is this idea of, of politics right? and, and what, it, 
what's going on. And what I think is interesting is to point out that there have been periods in US history where instead of government going into debt, they ran a surplus. In fact, they sent checks to every taxpayer saying, hey, sorry, we overtaxed you this year. Here's your money back. Right? And it wasn't a tax refund like you as an individual overpaid. It was literally government revenues exceeded government spending that year. But lately, it seems like every single year, the, the accounting works out such that it is more spending than revenue. Right? And that, to me, is, is an argument that it's not the case that this is merely a difficult problem. Because if it were a difficult problem, we'd see you know, errors on both sides. Some years, we would tax too little or spend too much or whichever way. Other years, we'd run a surplus. Right? So if it was just difficult, there would be surplus years. And we haven't seen one in a while. And so I wonder if you two could comment on why is it the case that governments have a propensity, it seems, to tax too little and spend too much? They don't tax too little. They tax too much. Uh, so well, I have to disagree with that so part. Sorry, uh, but but yeah, budget. you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I already cited, uh, paraphrased one Milton Friedman quote. Let me paraphrase another, because I'm sure I won't have it right. Uh, which is that governments will spend every single penny they collect and as much additional as they can get away with borrowing. Uh, so public choice tells us that politicians like to buy votes with other people's money, and, and that's what they generally do. Now, there are exceptions, as you indicated in your question. Uh, we had surpluses in 1980, 1998, 1999, and 2000. Why? Because after the 1994 election, there was a period where Republicans were actually good on spending and Bill Clinton was willing to triangulate. And so for a four-year period, government spending in nominal terms only grew by an average of 2.9% a year. Well, if your government spending is growing 2.9% a year and your nominal GDP, which of course is very much related to your nominal revenues, tax revenues, that's growing like 5 or 6% a year. So if you maintain that trend line for a while, guess what? you wind up with a budget surplus like we did in the, uh, in the, at the end of the 1990s. Likewise, after Obama's first blowout year when he had his fake stimulus, well, then we had the 2010 election. We got the Tea Party Republicans, and again, for a while, Republicans were good. Usually they get corrupted after a while, uh, like they are now. Uh, but after the 2010 elections, Republicans were very good, fought very hard. And what happened? We had a five-year nominal spending freeze between 2009 and 2014. What happened? We didn't get to a budget surplus, but the deficit fell by more than 50%. We made great progress. And if we had simply kept up some sort of limit on the growth of government spending, uh, we would have gotten good results. Uh, but it's all a function of how fast does government spending grow. By the way, you mentioned how data can sometimes be distorting and not be as optimistic as we think. Let me give an example of that, just a quick digression. Everyone focuses on the unemployment rate. Oh, look, the unemployment rate is low. That's good, but why is it low? It's low in part because our labor force participation rate has fallen. Two percentage points of our population that used to be working is no longer working which of course means that for employers, there's sometimes a labor shortage, but more relevant as an economist, the problem is, is that that's 2% of our population that used to be contributing to GDP, and now they're not. So it's more important when you're focusing on having a bigger national income, greater average levels of prosperity, you want to focus on either the labor force participation rate or the employment population ratio, two different data sets by the Department of Labor both of them, in the long run, are more important than the unemployment rate. Which means you're back to productivity, right. as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like productivity is the important thing, and the consumption that comes from productivity is sort of the secondary you know, effect of these things. Uh, so <clears throat> I want to uh, ask another question. And, and before we open it up to Q&A from the audience, and I believe we have a, uh, do we have a microphone for the audience, or are we all doing Slido from even the audience as well? Perfect. Okay, so if you have questions and you're in the audience, please, uh, by all means, use the Slido link uh, and send them in so that I can get them on my phone and, and ask our expert panelists these. Uh, but the question I, I want to sort of lead off with before we uh, dive into the, the Q&A from everyone else, uh, while I have you and I get to ask you the questions I want to ask, uh, is to what extent do you think 
we can look at the effect of COVID on labor market participation. Do you think that uh, this is a transitory 2% decline? Do you think it's here for, uh, I don't want to say forever, but uh, is there something, because it seems weird that it's still low, you know, three years on, or almost yeah, three years on almost now. It seems weird that it's still so low and that that is what's driving the low unemployment rates that we see. So is there something that, that we can do to maybe bring people back, or is this just the new normal? Well, hopefully it's not the new normal, but what we have seen in Europe, uh, it, it is obviously the new normal, and uh, people don't come home, uh, don't go back to, to their offices. They, they prefer home offices uh, where we know. And those people who have been productive continue to be productive there, but those who have not been productive beforehand are even less productive. At least this is what the studies show us. Plus, um, people just simply, as I mentioned before, with the so-called work-life balance, people simply prefer their 20-hour work. And uh, since they had been given all the handouts by the governments in the past years, over those two and a half years of COVID, um, they still think, hey, we are entitled to those handouts. We don't need to work productively in a company or in an, in an enterprise or wherever. And there has been a huge change in mindset and I think this is the big problem for us uh, because those changes in mindset have not happened in Asia and, our, and other places in the world who we compete with. But we in Europe are com completely losing out on that front. And this uh, labor productivity is totally down. Plus, in addition to that, we've seen uh, the, the, the wage price spiral coming up now. All the negotiations um, have been in the recent negotiations um, with the unions, where we have had uh, labor, uh, where we have had uh, uh, raise, uh, rises in in um, in, um, in in salary of, of seven, eight, nine percent, just with one round, and this is sparking inflation even more so. So these are two big problems that we will face at least in Europe, and I don't see an end to that. Um, plus, uh, as you already pointed out, um, the population pyramid is upside down, and there is lack of, pro uh, lack of young people joining the labor force in Europe. Those who are good leave Europe to go to the Americas or Asia, uh, where they have better opportunities, unfortunately, and uh, that will be an issue in the future. Sorry to be so negative, no. but that's, these are facts. <clears throat> Let me add some negative news from America on this. Uh, there was a short run factor that hopefully is going to be like a pig through a python and won't have a long run effect, which is that a lot of older <laughs> workers, when COVID hit, uh, instead of retiring, waiting till 66 to retire, some of them retired at 62. So, so there was a, there was a, seems to be a permanent, well, not permanent, but temporary uptick of early retirement among people that were sort of at that cutoff stage and they had enough assets that they figured, okay, I'll retire now, why bother dealing with all this hassle? I hope that has an, isn't a long run trend. What might be a long run trend though, is I already mentioned labor force participation rate being key. Probably the most worrisome labor force participation number is that prime working age males. There, I think I, the last data I saw, it's down to 87% labor force participation. Now, what's driving that? COVID obviously acceler accelerated a little bit. It's bumping back up, but the long run trend is still down. Government benefit payments and various government programs make it possible for people not to work and be productive. And this gets to, you know, Barbara and I have both been sort of touching on the fact that there's a moral component to this. You know, do you think it's okay not to work and live off other people? That in some sense, is a very grave danger for our societies. And I, I suppose I should use this opportunity. Why do we keep talking about productivity? Mm. Yeah. There are two factors of production, labor, labor and capital. Labor is us. Capital is the technology and ideas and equipment that we work with. If you want more national income, you obviously want labor to be efficiently allocated, and you want workers to be productive, produce more per hour work. Well, the more that government throws sand in the gears, 
with regulation and trade barriers and things like that, and the more government lures people out of the labor force with uh, benefit payments and uh, uh, things like that, and the more government is overtaxing, saving, and investing with dividend taxes, capital gains taxes, death taxes, corporate taxes. I mean, you literally can tax saving and investing as many as four different times on the same dollar of income in the United States. It's very hard to have a productive, dynamic economy when, from every possible angle, government is punishing the things that enable us to become richer as a society. That's a great point. And one thing that I, I want to bring up is, and this comes from the audience as well, uh, so we've seen obviously huge increases in productivity over generations and even in the last decade. I would argue that productivity is up quite, quite a bit. Uh, we've seen increased autom automation as well. So with this, and you combine sort of this decreased labor force participation rate, uh, do you think something like a universal basic income is inevitable, necessary, or just not good policy? Not good policy. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also think it's bad policy, because the, the, the theory from the advocates is that if everyone gets you know, a lot of money from the government, well, they'll then be able to focus on what they really want to do. They won't have underlying financial anxiety. And they'll go out. They'll still work because you know, they'll want to be fulfilled. Well, I worry, as we just said, that some people think it's perfectly OK not to be fulfilled. Uh, I remember going to Switzerland back in, I think it was, what, 2015 when they had that referendum on the basic income? Yeah. Uh, and this was, like, incredibly generous, like $27,000 uh, for a, for a two-person household. Uh, and, uh, and I spoke at a conference against it. It then got defeated by, I think, 78% of the voters. So I, wow. I take credit for that. <laughs> uh, I, I doubt the, the Swiss are people of reason. <laughs> I, I doubt I affected a single vote, but I was, I was glad that they defeated it after I spoke at that conference about why it would be a bad idea. Uh, I, I just, what was the big lesson we learned from Bill Clinton's welfare reform? If we make it harder to be dependent on government, labor force participation will increase. And oh, by the way, contrary to what Moynihan and other defenders of the old system said, child poverty went down not up. In other words, welfare reform was a success from a left-wing perspective as well as, a, as well as from a market-friendly perspective. One little example from Germany. Uh, you might recall the Social Democrat Chancellor Schröder. Mm -hmm. He did the so-called Hartz IV reforms, which were labor market reforms and were against all the handouts. Um, and you know, the, he literally cut them. He knew when he did that, he will never be elected uh, to office again. He took the risk, saved the German economy by that, and Merkel could do whatever she did in the, in the following years, and uh, was riding on the success wave that he had built on, because he literally cut those fails and wrong incentives. So I want to push back on the, the negativity of the UBI, just to play devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, it's often been proposed as an alternative to current welfare spending and say, you know, we could cut or eliminate all welfare programs and in, instead replace it with this universal basic income. Uh, but this leads to questions of how feasible is it that these cuts to the responsibility to bring it back to where we were talking earlier, uh, cutting the responsibility of the beast, uh, how feasible is it to think that those will last? Well, to give an example, uh, Milton Friedman said things that vaguely could be considered sympathetic to universal basic income. And Charles Murray, who unquestionably is a market-friendly libertarian, he is an explicit advocate of universal basic income. But this is where I think public choice comes in. Does anybody actually think if a new universal handout is enacted that politicians will get rid of the hundreds of other redistribution? programs that are out there? Are they really going to get rid of housing subsidies and food stamps and disability and all these other things? No, they will add it on top of the current system. So the theory, I understand it. And my former colleague at the Cato Institute, Michael Tanner, he's much more sympathetic to UBI than I was. So yes, there is a logic to it. But as I would always tell Michael, I don't trust politicians. And the Swiss voters obviously didn't trust that uh, it would work well either. 
Plus, there is also one additional thing. Um, it will not remain at the same level. It will always grow and grow as taxes always grow because we don't, we, we, this is why we argue for tax competition in order to reduce the taxes and not to raise them. And if you have a, a universal basic income, you will end up in the same way. They, it will grow and grow and grow to disincentivize uh, work and any productivity at all. Excellent. So I want to take advantage of the fact that we have uh, Dr. Colm on the panel and ask a question from the audience as well. Uh, what are the downsides to not bailing out a bank like the Silicon Valley Bank uh, versus uh, bailing them out or not bailing them out? Or are there upsides to not bailing them out? Well, you know, in Europe we have bailed out banks mm -hmm. as of recent, um, at least in, uh, after the so-called uh, big financial crisis that hit us in Europe as a sovereign debt crisis and not as a banking crisis and uh, in, in 2008. Um, my personal argument, and I have to be very careful, right. we're still in a quiet period, so this is why I'm, I, I'm, I try to be very uh, diplomatic on that. I do not argue for bailouts of, of banks and I don't think it's a good idea. It's rather looking beforehand at the regulatory issues, looking at the oversight, seeing if there have been problems in oversight or overseeing the banks, and then you can, uh, then you make the decisions. And that I would, I would stop at that point now, uh, but I think I was pretty clear. Well, let me add something on that. Uh, there are different types of bailouts. One of the reasons I thought TARP was such a disgusting piece of legislation is that we didn't just bail out depositors. We bailed out entire financial institutions, which meant bailing out the shareholders and the bondholders and the executives of these institutions. The good news, so to speak, relatively speaking, about Silicon Valley Bank is that those people were hurt. The depositors were protected above and beyond the $250,000 limit on deposit insurance. So you can complain about that, and I would complain about that. But at least some people who touch the hot stove burn their fingers. There's a famous, I don't know who said it, but there's a famous line, capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without hell. You want, you want a dynamic economy where there is bankruptcy, where entrepreneurs can create new goods and services that displace and, and in effect drive out of business uh, the, the old way of doing things. That's what gives us this greater level of productivity that we've been talking about. If you do bailouts, and, and this is what worries me, is you probably know this more than I do, it sounds like this UBS takeover of Credit Suisse is the wrong kind of bailout. Uh, now, you can't comment on that because of your role as a central banker, uh, and, and I'm not enough of an expert on it, but I worry it's, it smells to me what I've read in the newspapers. That's like a TARP bailout, which means that everyone at Credit Suisse uh, gets to keep their jobs. Now, I did read that some of the bondholders get hurt, so hopefully it might be more like Silicon Valley Bank, but, but here's the one thing that's greatly unfair. And uh, uh, Senator Langford of Oklahoma hit Janet Yellen about this at a recent congressional hearing. You're bailing out Silicon Valley Bank, at least the, all the depositors, including all their deposits above $250,000, because you have arbitrarily decided, probably on the basis of political uh, connections, that it's systemically important. And he asked, what about a small community bank in Oklahoma? Will they get that treatment? I'm a big believer What's in the that? rule of law. Whatever the rules are, they should apply equally to everyone. And clearly, having this cronious system where if you have a bunch of uh, Silicon Valley people who have the direct lines to their members of Congress, bailing them out but not bailing out a small community bank, that bothers me economically as, a, as an economist. But it bothers me as a human being because I don't think little people should be treated worse than big people. So we have about two and a half minutes left. And what I want to do with the last question for the day is, is ask, you know, since we've had a lot of doom and gloom today, what piece of news or what reforms or what is it that gives you the most hope about the next 5, 10, 20 years that you see uh, in your field today? You start. I, I, I was going to hope you would start, so I had time to think of what can I be optimistic about. Okay, l l let me say something optimistic. It's not optimistic for this year or next year. But if you go back 10 years ago, Republicans in Congress actually were voting for and supporting 
genuine good entitlement reform, block granting of Medicaid, building upon Bill Clinton's welfare reform, and shifting Medicare into a premium support system, sort of akin to what federal employees have for their health insurance. Those reforms would have saved over decades trillions of dollars and sort of taken that long-run trend line to government spending and knocked it down a couple of notches. Government still would have grown, but there was a chance with these entitlement reforms, it would have grown slower than the private sector. And that long-run trend line, is government growing faster or is the private sector growing faster? That is the key challenge. We want to make sure government doesn't consume more and more and a greater and greater share of our economic output. And, and Republicans, in the, in the recent memory, were willing to be good on entitlement reform. They sort of forgot all that because Trump was a big government populist. But maybe in 2024, Republicans will get their legs back under them again and be willing to do the right thing for the right reason in the genuine and proper sense of what patriotism should be. Besides those political things that you mentioned, uh, there is plenty of young people now who start um, looking at what Austrian economics can tell us, mm -hmm. that there are institutions like Acton Institute and many others that we collaborate with uh, that educate the next generation, that make them curious, to ask the right questions and also to take up responsibility. And I think this is what makes me positive. And after all, uh, Schumpeter also was an Austrian, and I think we believe in, in new ideas, new solutions for everything that we have. So that's, I think, what I would add to what Dan had said. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. And I want to thank everyone in the audience, both online and in person, for attending today's event. I want to thank the Acton Institute for hosting it, the Free Market Roadshow, and my two panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, please enjoy lunch in the area if you have not already done so. Get some refreshments, and then we'll come back at 1.30 for the next session.
No. I want to welcome everybody back to the uh, Free Market Road Show here in Grand Rapids. Uh, my name is Eric Cohn. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the Acton Institute, who's uh, really thrilled to be hosting this event today. Uh, I want to welcome my panelists for this session, where we are going to be discussing Unleashing the Entrepreneur. Uh, I want to remind people that we are taking questions for this over Slido. So if you go to slido.com and you enter uh, uh, FRMS, that'll get you into the queue. Enter your questions there, and I'll be uh, reading through those as we go through the uh, discussion today. Uh, I want to thank both of our panelists as they join us. John Chisholm, uh, who is right here to my right. Uh, has three decades of experience as an entrepreneur, CEO, and investor, a pioneer in online marketing research. He founded and served as CEO and chairman of Decisive Technology, now a part of Google, a publisher of the first desktop and client server software for online surveys. Uh, later, he founded and served as CEO chairman of uh, Customer, Customer Stat, now part of Confirmit, a leading provider in enterprise feedback management today. He is CEO of John Chisholm Ventures. How'd you come up with that name? Uh, a startup advisory and angel investing group. Uh, he is past president and chair of the Worldwide MIT Alumni Association, a member of the MIT Corporation Board of Trustees, and a trustee of the Santa Fe Institute. He is the author of Unleash Your Inner Company, Use Passion and Perseverance to Build Your Ideal Business. We're also going to uh, give away a free copy of that book, and uh, John will choose one lucky person uh, after the event who will, we already see one enthusiastic hand up. I, <laughs> Kurt being enthusiastic, that's entirely new to me. Um, <laughs> He also holds a BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. To his right is my Acton colleague Dylan Palman, who is the executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at the Acton Institute. He's the author of the book Foundations of a Free and Virtuous Society, published here by Acton in 2017. And he is a PhD candidate in the Institute for Theology and Liberal Arts at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, London. So welcome to both of them. Good to be here. John, I want to start with you. Uh, so our subject is unleashing the entrepreneur. And you know, I read through your bio here. You, you sound like an entrepreneur who has been unleashed. Uh, walk us through your personal experience, um, your entrepreneurial endeavors, and the characteristics kind of both that are innate and that you develop over time to really engage in, in entrepreneurship. Well, uh, first of all, Eric, thanks so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here at Acton. Um, I'd like to start by taking you back to the single year of my life where I learned the most about entrepreneurship, business, and life. And that year was 2000 and 2001, the dot-com bust. Now, just to refresh your memory, the internet first became commercially available and productized in the 1990s. Billions of dollars were invested and over-invested 
uh, commercializing the internet. Companies like Amazon, eBay, Google, all were uh, started during that time. And that huge overinvestment peaked in 1999 and collapsed in 2000 and 2001, the dot-com bust, when tens of thousands of uh, internet companies started going out of business. At that time, I was running my second company, Customer Set. We did online customer satisfaction measurement. Started the company in 97. We grew rapidly and had healthy growth for the first three years. But in the first quarter of 2001, I would often wake up in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin at 2 in the morning. Our second round of financing, our Series B round, refused to close despite a flurry of meetings with investors as we ran out of cash. Those nights I would get up, shower off the sweat, and try to get back to sleep. When my management team and I finally realized that our Series B round was not going to close, we huddled to figure out what to do. First, we cut our own salaries, and those a few weeks later of all of our employees, by 10%. I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce. 40% of the company I'd spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing and I broke down sobbing in front of our employees. They stood there stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed that their CEO was crying in front of them. That first quarter of 2001, our revenues fell by 20%, a lot for a recurring revenue software as a service business. To help us get through, one of our investors lent me $300,000 for the company, but not to the company, but for me to pass through to the company, meaning that I would be personally liable for repaying that loan. Later, I would repay that investor, to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful, by mortgaging the townhouse that I lived in, in Menlo Park, California. Uh, to save on rent, we consolidated in the less attractive second floor of our building to, and rented out the first floor to another company. That company, another startup, came in, uh, quit paying us rent after about 60 days, came in late one weekend night, cleared out all their belongings, and disappeared without a trace. To help make payroll, we factored receivables. That is, we sold our future receivables for a 20% discount for cash today, an expensive maneuver you don't want to do routinely. I, I dropped my salary to minimum wage, the legal limit. Finally, we could see profitability ahead in the third quarter of 2001. And then, as you know, on September 11th, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center. The entire Northeast communications grid was down. It took an entire day just to confirm that all of our employees were still alive. Even though we were 3,000 miles away on the, in Silicon Valley, on the west coast of the United States, even there, every company I know of had customers or clients who lost employees or family members in the terrorist attacks. If the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 did not kill a startup, Almost certainly, the terrorist attacks of September 11th did. Well, we did not make a profit in that first quarter of 2000 and that third quarter of 2001. We did break even in the fourth quarter. Uh, the going kept tough for the next 18 months. Uh, we didn't hire a single new employee for 18 months, but we made it through, and the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Often I've wondered why did customer sat survive when so many other companies, most other companies of our size and cohort, failed. I absolutely don't think we were smarter than other management teams. We absolutely did not have more in the way of resources than other management teams did. Customer sat only raised $2.94 million in its entire life. One of our clients was Webvan, which raised $75 million before its IPO, and then famously $300 million in its IPO, and then declared bankruptcy 14 months after its IPO. So we didn't have more in the way of resources. If I had to attribute it to just two factors, I would say it was these. Number one, we cared more deeply about our 
management uh, company than other management teams did about all aspects of it, about the coolness of our products, our relationships with our customers, and about each other more than other management teams did. And two, we stuck with it longer. As I mentioned, it was another seven years before the company was acquired. Many other companies just gave up and threw in the towel before that. So in short, it was this combination of passion and perseverance, in my view, that got us through. Passion is an attitude, perseverance is a behavior, and in many aspects of our lives, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. Uh, and I can say much more about this, uh, but uh, we hear a lot about passion these days. That's getting boring. Some books also talk about perseverance. That's more interesting. No one is talking about the two, how the two reinforce each other. And so if you can think of any area of your life where you've experienced this positive feedback between passion and perseverance, uh, that's likely to be a really good area in my experience to start a business or consider starting a business. Before I go uh, over to Dylan, um, I want to ask you about, you know, you, you brought up a cup, uh, at least one exogenous event. You know, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 are something that we really couldn't have seen coming. Um, the dot-com bubble bursting uh, was another enormous event. Um, in a way, separate out those two things for a moment and talk about kind of just the normal operation of a business like that as an op entrepreneur, as someone who's building that business. What were the things that made your life most difficult in trying to develop and grow that business? Again, setting aside those kind of big world calamitous events that also influenced uh, that period of time for you. Well, the most essential thing uh, an entrepreneur has to do, oh gosh, there are so many different things. One of the things is to ensure a fit between a real unsatisfied customer need and a, a solution to that need. And that fit is constantly changing because you're gaining new resources all the time, new knowledge, new team members, uh, experience, uh, new understandings of the market, and the needs are always changing because uh, new products and services, your competitors are always coming to the market, they're being satisfied, and, and so ensuring that fit between an unsatisfied customer need, constantly searching for it, and, and d d doing your best to find a solution for it is, is, is one thing. Uh, Creating win-wins among your team members is another. Uh, a, uh, it's, it's very easy to uh, get into a mindset where things are a zero-sum or a negative-sum game in any business, including startups. And it's constantly your job as the leader to find, articulate, and persuade your team members and your customers and all of your stakeholders that uh, your business represents a win-win for them. Uh, uh, it could be a career opportunity for team members. It could be uh, a better solution and solving uh, a customer need, more loyal customers in the case of our product, um, on the part of customers, uh, on the part of, of investors. Uh, this is going to be uh, a, a great opportunity for them. And so creating these win-wins is, is uh, the, the way I think about uh, the uh, essential management challenge. You know, Dylan, one of the reasons I love doing these kinds of events here at uh, Acton is we have someone like John who's an entrepreneurial practitioner. Um, and then we can combine that with the work that we do here at the Acton Institute, understanding uh, kind of the, the academic perspective, the fundamentals of all of it. We can answer that uh, age-old University of Chicago question of uh, it works in practice, does it work in theory? <laughs> um, talk about, uh, I think something that John was uh, referencing earlier uh, actually sets up well for what we talked about that uh, you wanted to start off with, uh, the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000-2001. 
Um, that was an incredibly painful time for a lot of people. A lot of entrepreneurs who had startups uh, lost their businesses. Uh, John, of course, has a great story here about uh, one that survives. But a lot of companies went out of business. Um, you know, talk about the role of uh, that churn in the marketplace uh, and that kind of failure is also being really important part of the entrepreneurial process. Yeah, so I think somewhat counterintuitively, and I, I am an academic, so I do approach this more from a theoretical uh, perspective, although my, my wife is an entrepreneur, but I don't want to draw too much on her, her cachet. But, uh, um, but I, I, think, I think failure is actually the most important thing. If you want to unleash entrepreneurship, it, it, it all comes down to your perspective on failure. Um, and, and John, I, that was like the perfect <laughs> uh, story that you started with because your perspective was very different. You know, the, what is perseverance if not learning how to get back up again every time you fail? Um, and so in a personal, from a personal point of view, uh, if you aspire to be an entrepreneur, um, but you have a fear of failing, you will never try. Or if you define uh, one failure as proof that you will never succeed, you'll never try again. Um, but if you say, what can I learn from this? As, as John did, you know, that's when you learned the most was when your things, times were the hardest. Um, if, you, if you say, I learned more from failing than success, um, then you're, you're going to find those ways. You're going to be looking at the world from a different perspective. So you can put that into the context of a company. Uh, you can fail well or poorly. Um, your business could have failed, right? But because you strive to do so well, because you saw it as a real, you know, a real possibility um, and something that wasn't just personal. You didn't just walk away and say, okay, I'm just going to abandon this, you know. Um, but we're going to find ways to, to stick it out and we're going to look at the circumstances around us soberly and you know realistically you're able to succeed and reinvent the company and keep it going um, and we can keep going you look at markets look at industries look at economies even um, if we have just uh, a static view on our economy um, we will put in place every measure we possibly can to prevent failure so um, uh, an example of this uh, we're here in Michigan um, a uh, big state for the auto industry. At one time, it was incredibly dynamic. Uh, you know, you had Henry Ford in the assembly line. He's trying new things. He's taking these risks, um, and he's able to su succeed. Fast forward to the, the 1980s. Suddenly, we have competition come from Japan, um, and everyone, um, whether, you know, the companies, the unions, the cities, state even, um, everyone just had this very static mindset of, you know, in, De in Detroit, we make cars. In Flint, we make cars. Um, and they didn't ask, well, what else could our companies be doing? Or how could we be doing this differently? They just tried to set up barriers to other people challenging them. They, they tried to insulate themselves from failure rather than accept it as just part of their part of life, that all throughout life, we're going to try things and we're going to fail. Um, and success is more about how do you get back up again? How do you persevere through that failure than never failing at all? Um, uh, you, you don't do amazing things by never failing. You do amazing things by being willing to fail, to, to try that great thing, um, even if failure should come. So that, that to me is, is, from a theoretical point of view, uh, a through line, whether it's in a, a person's personal life, whether we talk about public policy. Um, so uh, in the last panel, Joseph Schumpter was mentioned, for example. Uh, he talks about this idea of creative destruction that how economies grow is through one market industry or you know, uh, business being destroyed because something new and better has come along. So to use automobiles again, when, when the automobile became affordable, a lot of blacksmiths went out of business. Um, that's sad for the blacksmith and absolutely should care. And we, we need communities in this country that can prop those up who have been left behind uh, when we have rapid economic change. But by and large, the vast majority of people were leaps and bounds better. They were not just quantitatively better, they were qualitatively better. The quality of their life changed, not just better incomes, that sort of thing. But now you can, you can visit family in the next city so much easier. You can ship things across the country so much easier. You know, all the, all the benefits that came from that. Um, you needed to have a market open. The government could have stepped in and said, we're not going to let these blacksmiths fail. Instead, we're going to keep the automobile 
um, from threatening them. And what will we have? Well, nothing like we have today. It doesn't matter how much you improve uh, being a blacksmith, it's never going to compete with the internal combustion engine, right? Uh, although we do still measure uh, the power of engines and horsepower. It's a little unfair to the horses, I think. But, <laughs> um, but, but you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a relic of that, that initial beginnings of the industry, that this was how far we were outpacing the horse. Um, so you need that everywhere. Uh, if, we, if we don't have that, then you start to stagnate, and you can even uh, end up with you know, uh, uh, regression or depression. Um, so that's the most important thing to me, is to, to be realistic about failure and to, to be able to fail, to realize that, that the more we try to prevent the little failures in our life, rather than accepting them, taking them with stride, having the, the virtue, the resilience uh, to get back up again, the bigger our failure is going to be when it finally comes. So. The other side of that, failure that you talked about is the rise of a mentality. We certainly heard this back in 2008 with regard to the financial crisis, that we looked at a lot of firms and said, they're too big to fail, uh, that we can't allow this level of failure. What do you think drives that mentality to say, you know, as you pointed out, uh, failure, again, we, we got a lot of great Milton Friedman quotes in the last panel. I'll add one now, at least as I, uh, as I remember it, that people describe capitalism uh, or markets as a system of profit and loss. And the loss part is just as important, if not more important, than the profit part, because losses are what get, of, get rid of bad, poorly managed companies. But then in comes this mentality that says, oh, we can't let these firms fail. It's too important. What drives that mentality to, that wants to prevent that important loss and failure part of it from running its course? So, you know, in the case of the, the financial crisis, there are a lot of factors. You know, like everything in the economy, it's, it's more complex than my wonderful little theoretical soundbite. But um, so part of that was the way in which we got into that situation um, was through government subsidized home mortgages um, and, and mortgage-backed uh, securities. Um, so you, you have things already distorted by the government. Um, that's not to say that, therefore, OK, the solution to intervention is more intervention. Um, but there is a consideration to be made. I'm not totally defending it, because I, I do think, yeah, let things fail if they can fail. But if you're looking at, OK, everything fails and the whole economy collapses, yeah, there is a, a last resort role for the state to sometimes step in. Um, but to me, OK, if in, there is an emergency, there's a crisis, sometimes, yeah, we need state action. But we got to take a step back and say, how do we prevent this from happening again? Um, and how did we get to where we got um, so that that was the case? Well, if you have just one company, you know, which is not really the case in the financial sector uh, back in 2008, it wasn't like there was one big monopoly. And if it failed, well, then everything went away. So that was not really the case. Um, but if, if you have all the eggs in one basket, then yeah, now you're, you're incredibly fragile. Um, so you, once again, that that leads me to ask, what are we doing that's keeping newcomers from entering this market and from challenging you know, this uh, dominance by one or you know, many big companies? Um, and usually you're going to find that fear of failure at the heart of it, that, that somebody is looking for the easy win um, at the expense of long-term success. Uh, I understand that the number of uh, startups in uh, the U.S. has declined steadily per 10,000 working age Americans from high 20s in the 1980s to the uh, mid 20s in the 90s to the low 20s in the knots to the uh, high teens in the uh, decade we've just completed. And uh, why is that? And I see two main obstacles to entrepreneurship. Uh, one is regulatory, and two is psychological. Uh, in most regards, starting a company, in my experience, has gotten easier over the last 30 years. I started my first company in 1992, so that was just over 30 years ago. Uh, since that time, we've got the internet, we've got online apps. If you want to outsource an entire department that is not 
uh, strategic to your business. You can find a way to do that with technology that's available today that didn't exist back in 1992. Uh, software development platforms are much more powerful th today than they were 30 years ago. What, what might have taken a dozen software developers back then may have taken a half a dozen software developers 10 or 15 years ago, something that w takes one or two software developers today. I remember how difficult it was to take a credit card through a website back in the 1990s. Well, that's a trivial operation today, as an example. So in, in, I could go on and on. It's easier to find suppliers, customers, uh, investors who share your passions and, and uh, industry focus nowadays than it was way back then. Only in one regard has starting a business, in my experience, gotten harder, and that is regulatory compliance. And I could give dozens of examples. Let me just give one example. Uh, uh, worker status determination. That's to determine whether a worker is an employee or a contractor. Uh, to, uh, it's become ever harder to use contractors uh, without them being considered employees. Contractors make it possible to start a company because you can hire them for as many hours a day or per week as you can afford and as they're available. And as your company gains resources and momentum and revenues and so forth, you can gradually bring them on for more and more until you're at a point and they're willing to join you full time as an employee. Nowadays, very often, you have to make them an employee from an outset, even if they don't want to be an employee. We see this especially in California, where I'm from, uh, with uh, Assembly Bill 5. Uh, so it's, it's, and, and to justify that someone is a contractor rather than employee, you may have to fill out a, a six-page form for every individual. Uh, so th that's just one example, and I could, I could offer many others. So uh, that's one thing. The other key obstacle, I think, to entrepreneurship these days is psychological. And I think this is the biggest obstacle. Because if I believe I have the skills and knowledge and passion and perseverance and relationships and other resources to start a business and make it a success, success I, I will be able to, even if I don't have those resources. In contrast, if, even, even if I do have those, all of those resources, but I don't believe I have the resources to do it, I won't be able to make that, to start that company and make it a success. So psychology is such an important driver. I'm reminded of the remark by uh, President Obama, uh, you didn't build that. I'm sure everybody remembers when he said that. How unhelpful. Uh, how destructive of the positive mindset of the, the next generation of builders and entrepreneurs in this country uh, to uh, of take away whatever modest credit they might deserve and, uh, and uh, enthusiasm they might have for starting something new uh, by saying you didn't build that. Uh, just the opposite mindset w would be really wonderful. Uh, and, and words from our, our nation's chief executive. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more I could say about uh, this, but what can you do to protect yourself from negative influences like that? Uh, I think it's helpful to draw what I call a stars chart. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, the word stars with two A's and two R's, your skills, technologies, assets, achievements, relationships, reputation, and strengths as in inner strengths. And in, under each of those words, write down all of the resources that you have to start a business, whether or not it seems relevant to, to a business or not. This is a good exercise for anyone to do, even if you're not a potential entrepreneur. And it puts you right in front of you all the resources you have to start a business. 
and that's building of your self-confidence. Uh, and also reading inspirational books. I think the most inspirational book I've ever read is Atlas Shrugged. Has anyone heard of it or read it? It's a novel about entrepreneurs by Ayn Rand. And uh, it may be why I got into entrepreneurship myself. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it pleases me no end that my own book is most frequently described as inspirational. Uh, that's Unleash Your Inner Company. That may, might be another one. Uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People is a great, uh, I, I could go on and on, but those are some thoughts. Well, John, you, the stats that you had at the beginning of uh, what you were saying there uh, actually dovetails pretty well into this question from the audience. I want to remind people we're taking questions on Slido. Go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. Enter F-M-R-S to uh, enter the question if you have one. Uh, the question is, the United States is one of the most, if not the most, entrepreneurial countries in the world. Why is that the case? Or I guess, you know, John, feel free to answer some uh, context to those numbers you had at the beginning. Why do you think it's declining? Well, well negative psychological influences, regulatory constraints. I think of the economy as a huge, n-dimensional space. You'll have to forgive me, I'm an engineer from MIT, and so I think in high dimensions. Of course, we can only visualize three dimensions, but that's fine, think of three dimensions. A big, huge, three-dimensional space. Now a regulation comes along and cuts off half of that space. Okay, there's only half of a space left now for all of us to make a living in and to find a way to solve a customer need in. Another regulation comes along and further cuts that space. And then another, and then another. And all the range of possibilities that that huge high dimensionality space used to represent is, is limited down to a narrow box, a narrow cube. Think of what it would be like for organisms, people, animals, people, to be in a tiny little space. They're all competing with each other, aren't they? As opposed to uh, taking advantage of all the possibilities the world has to offer. Uh, so every regulation has the potential to uh, disallow new businesses. Uh, I'm reminded of Bastiat, who wrote a, a book called uh, What is Unseen, and uh, you know, it's easy to see what may be real benefits of a new regulation, but it's hard to see what new innovation is disallowed because of the regulation. I like the idea of uh, regulation uh, impact assessments being required whenever there is a new regulation. All of us know about environmental impact assessments that are required for a new real estate project. Uh, how about innovation impact assessments that force us to consider and evaluate what are the likely innovations that are being squelched by each new regulation? I think it would at least raise sensitivity to the issue. Just to, to add to that, because I wouldn't disagree at all, uh, there's also this history we have that the United States from its very beginning, from its founding, is a commercial republic. And you know, we have this idea of an American dream. If you can just make it here, you can make something of yourself. You can have a better life for your children uh, with hard work, with creativity. Um, and that is something that people don't believe anymore, at least not as much anymore. As, you know, to get to your point earlier about the psychology of entrepreneurship, um, in many ways we're living in a nation where that's harder due to regulation, but we're also living at a time where that story is not being told as it used to um, and where people aren't believing it like they used to. Uh, and so you know, we still have it. It's still here. Um, if you compare us to other developed nations, we are still one of the most entrepreneurial in the world. Um, but as far as the, the decline, I think that's got to be part of the story, um, that 
we just don't believe our own story anymore. We don't believe our own principles anymore. Um, and yeah, there are reasons uh, to be pessimistic. If you look at regulation, well, usually that's not the reasons why people are pessimistic. Um, but they, even so, you can still do it. Um, and it's something that we really need to find a way to recapture for the next generations. It might not look exactly um, as it did in the past. You know, maybe the same way of telling that story isn't working, but that doesn't mean the story itself has lost its power. Um, and you know, there's institutions in our society. I think one of you know, you mentioned, um, I think it was uh, Friedman or whatever, but just about failure. You know, I was talking about that as well. But bankruptcy, bankruptcy is huge. The fact that it's, you can take a risk. If if your company goes bankrupt, you don't end up in a debtor's prison, right? Like there, there's institutions in our society that also allow that to happen, allow people to take that chance, uh, to look around and say, you know, I have something to offer and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. Um, but we have, to, we have to find a way uh, to encourage people. So, I mean, maybe that starts on a personal level. Maybe there's creative people in your life. Maybe you are one of those people. Um, so encourage them. At, figure out what, you know, what is holding them back. What are those barriers? And that's not going to be a one-size-fits-all answer, right? Um, but help people use the social networks they have. I, I love that idea of like just you know write out the seven different things and take stock of everything you have going for you. Um, that's something that feels very unnatural for me. I'm a millennial, so I'm not young anymore. But I used to be considered young. Um, that's something that I don't do. Uh, now I, I guess I have some entrepreneurial side to my my work. I write and I send it out, and half the things I write get rejected. Nobody ever reads them, and so I am taking chances. I am trying to be creative, um, but. But that's a step beyond, to just sit down and I'm going to take stock of everything I got going for me. Um, that's something that, that needs to be taught, um, that needs to be inspired, perhaps. Um, yeah. We've got another question from the audience, I uh, think provoked by Johnny reference to Atlas Shrugged. Uh, the question is, uh, what does an entrepreneur owe society in return for providing infrastructure and, quote, the rules of the game? Uh, and this uh, question says that uh, they believe that Ayn Rand misses that part in, uh, from her perspective. Misses the part of the, the part of uh, what does an entrepreneur owe society in return for providing things like infrastructure and, and the rules of the game, the rule of law uh, okay. to be able to proceed? Well, to hark to that, to answer that question, I'd like to hark to Steve Jobs, the late great founder of Apple. Uh, Steve Jobs was not very philanthropic in his lifetime. Uh, it's true. Uh, he, uh, even though he was a billionaire, he didn't give away much of his money, and that really didn't happen until after he died, and when it was done by his, his widow. And so a lot of people have said, or I've heard a lot of people say, that what an unethical guy, or that doesn't seem very moral uh, that he wasn't willing to do more of that. But look at all the good that Steve Jobs did. He made computing accessible. How many people here, like me, are old enough to remember computing before the Macintosh? Uh, MS-DOS, does that ring a bell? The Microsoft Disk Operating System. It was really hard, cumbersome. Uh, not very many people could use com personal computers because they didn't have the patience to learn it. The Macintosh opened all of that up. Uh, it first was optimized for desktop publishing. Uh, it made it much easier to create newsletters, books, printing. Uh, the laser printer was coupled with it. Uh, that spread information widely. Uh, later, he introduced the iPod, which enabled you to carry a thousand f songs around with you on your person, making entertainment readily accessible to people, millions of people, whatever music they might want to listen to. Through new technologies that they developed, or refined at least, like FaceTime, they allowed people to stay in touch with their loved ones and provided companionship and family connections to people who might otherwise be alone and by themselves. 
Uh, if you consider the entire supply chain of Apple's uh, products from the components and subassemblies, uh, on the one hand, all the way through to the people who work for the company, all the way through to the developers of the apps that run on Apple devices, millions of people, well, th certainly thousands and tens of thousands of people have become millionaires thanks to uh, Apple and, st and originally Steve Jobs. He has done tremendous good in the world much more good than someone could be just by giving money away, I think. And, and we, f we tend to forget that uh, just by providing new solutions to unsatisfied human needs, entrepreneurs are doing great good in the world. I think overall entrepreneurs are neither more honest or dishonest or uh, considerate of other people's needs uh, uh, or other people's concerns uh, than, than others. They're neither better nor worse family men and women than others are. But they do make this unique contribution to the world by finding new solutions to unsatisfied customer needs and that makes the world a better place. So, that is a huge ROI to society uh, in response to this question uh, that I think needs to be factored into the calculus. Dylan, we were talking on our podcast, Act and Unwind, this morning about the importance of uh, rhetoric and the way we talk about things to reflect the underlying thing we're describing. And so much of the rhetoric around uh, the, the general gist of that question, they talk about uh, successful people uh, giving back. And I always found that to be a bit of a rhetorical trap because I've never gotten the answer to the question, well, what did they take? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a fundamental, I, I will be clear, I'm, I'm probably not as much of an Ayn Rand fan <laughs> as, as John, but um, I will say there, there's an assumption in that question that infrastructure and rule of law are some kind of gracious gifts given by the government when in fact they are moral duties the government has to provide for every citizen of the nation. That's not something you say, well, what are you going to give me in exchange for this? Right? That would be incredibly immoral. That's how you have an incredibly corrupt government saying, well, we're not going to be fair to you in the courts. Uh, we're not going to repair your roads or your sewer system unless you're giving something to us. Um, so that is just, a, to me, a, an incredibly um, uh, mistaken way to conceive of what's going on. Um, but that said, there are all kinds of ways. And I, I think that John highlighted the most important one. Business is a, a social good. Uh, there's all kinds of ways in which business is a social good. Um, but that said, like businesses do pay taxes. Uh, there, are, there are all kinds of ways businesses are currently giving back. Um, so. I'm not really, I never quite understand the question either because I don't know if it presumes that someone took, but it at least presumes that they were given something uh, somewhat specially when in fact uh, a government that isn't giving infrastructure and rule of law to every citizen is merely failing in its most fundamental moral obligation. That's, it's not that, oh, they've given some people a gift and not other people. Uh, well, if that's what's happening, then it's an incredibly corrupt government that we're talking about. And actually uh, providing rule of law is not by any means the most expensive part of government. It's if you consider the courts, the dispute resolution, the protection of property rights, that's just a tiny part of what we pay for government currently. Some, uh, something that profoundly affected my thinking about property rights was an experiment that I was privileged to sit in on by Vernon Smith, the Nobel Prize winner in experimental economics. Uh, if you had asked me before I set in on this experiment what the source of property rights was, I think I would probably say governments. But uh, using this experiment where there were a bunch of tables in a conference room, each table was a group of people who were a business, and there was a big screen that showed uh, whether each business was making blue balls or red balls, and uh, to sell a product, you had to have one of each of these two balls. 
it's a very simplified economy, in other words. And uh, all of our tables suddenly realized that we could start stealing from other uh, tables uh, through the uh, network that was provided. Uh, and so just as uh, someone was about to sell a pair of red and blue balls that, that were a product, someone might steal one of the balls, and it ended up that none of us were making anything. And then suddenly, it, it dawns on one of the tables, hey guys, if we just trade rather than steal, we'll all make a lot more money. And uh, what uh, Vernon Smith's experiments showed is how property rights can emerge spontaneously by people uh, in the same community. It doesn't even have to come from the top down. And, and that's not surprising when you think about it because property rights of a primitive sort exist even in the natural world. I was in an uh, aquarium in uh, Rio de Janeiro a few weeks ago and I learned that moray eels have property rights or, or of, of a sort. They're territorial and uh, they defend their territory against uh, other moray eels who might come in, into that region and, and uh, take the food from that region. So uh, anyway, it doesn't take much in the way of government uh, to provide the basics that, that we really need. Go to another question from the audience here. Uh, it was said earlier that regulatory compliance is one of the hardest obstacles that entrepreneurs face. Uh, can you give an example of regulations that uh, are necessary and needed? Well, lots of regulations are, are needed and, and, and helpful and inescapable. There's no doubt about it. I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be regulations. Uh, but there's a good way to do regulations and there's a bad way. Uh, the best regulations are those that are informed by real court cases where there is a dispute and a court of law or a judge has to adjudicate and decide what the best resolution for that dispute is. Where, in other words, do you draw the boundary but in, the, in property rights? And if a statute is informed by that history of cases, in, in other words, by common law, uh, it will have the advantage of uh, aligning with what the society or community considers most fair and reasonable. Uh, so uh, we, the, so this is one of the best kept secrets, or at least people aren't talking about it or have forgotten about it. But up until about a century ago, the United States was primarily a common law country. That is, there were relatively few statutes uh, there were, most of the law was uh, determined by courts of law, judges, juries deciding what the best resolution. And one of the beautiful things about common law is it gives the judge the flexibility to find the optimal resolution between two uh, litigants. And so it's a learning process. If the litigants suggest a solution that they both consider ideal for both of them, it's unlikely that the judge is going to overturn that. And so uh, it's Im also implicitly a uh, sort of consensus-oriented legal regime. We have veered so far away from that over the last century that uh, people have almost forgotten about it. In fact, law schools nowadays just teach common law sort of as incidental rather than foundational. That's too bad, it seems to me, because it should be the foundation of law. It's emergent, organic, rather than imposed from the top down, as statutes are. I do I think there's an important point here as well about the word we're talking about, mm -hmm. regulate, yeah. to make regular. Um, I think so much of what we talk about in terms of regulation, though, isn't making things regular across all actors in a marketplace. It is making things quite irregular by picking and privileging 
certain firms or certain entities who have the ability to lobby politicians in order to get what they want. Yeah. So the, the German economist, uh, Walter Eucken, uh, who along with uh, Wilhelm Rupke and Lud Ludwig Erhard were kind of the architects of the West German economic miracle, their recovery after World War II and um, you know, Nazi party and before that, uh, during the Great Depression, they, just, they tried every terrible economic policy you can think of in Germany. Um, one of the things he said that's always stuck with me is regulation of market structures, yes. Regulation of market processes, no. His point being that if you're under your philosophy of regulation is we got to go in and we got to set the prices because we don't trust the market actors to do that, or we got to subsidize various industries or companies because we don't trust people to be able to, to start up um, on their own or to compete uh, with whether foreign or domestic competitors or so on and so forth. Um, when you do that, it just distorts everything that's just normal about human beings producing things out of their own creativity to serve the needs of other human beings and exchanging in a marketplace. Um, regulating market structures is about that market openness uh, that you need, the openness for newcomers, which means that openness to, yeah, some people aren't always going to be successful. Some businesses, uh, you know, they start up, they don't succeed, sometimes they're around for a little bit, then they fail, sometimes they sell out to something else, sometimes they become really big uh, and things go great, and then another industry comes along and completely displaces it. Um, that's all normal, and that's if you let that happen, uh, it's you know counterintuitively this great, great benefit for for everyone involved. So, uh, on the government side, I would say that's the good kind of regulation. It's regulation that keeps markets open, um, that that where equality before the law, rule of law, is really the standard. Um, but that's not the only way to regulate a market, and this doesn't get talked about enough. That. On the private side, there are all sorts of ways that you can regulate markets. So if you're concerned about, you know, so for example, and, and, and this, is, this comes up a lot, but I still think it's a great example. I believe in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, you have to have a government permit in order to be a hairdresser. Right? You have to get the permission of the, the government, whatever jurisdiction you're in, in order to be a hairstylist or to, to be a barber, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, it's the sort of thing that should be the easiest thing for any, any person in their home to say, I want to, you know, get some extra income. I want to maybe try this out. It should be easy, but instead they find themselves in the black market because they can't afford the, you know, year and a half and $3,000 of training they need to actually qualify for this certification. Um, but if you are concerned about whatever Governments may be concerned about with, with hairdressers. I heard recently an outbreak of ringworm among barbers, so I guess maybe there could be some health uh, concerns or whatever. Um, but a lot of that gets solved, A, first of all, through competition. So if you go to your barber and you get ringworm, you're probably not going to that barber again, right? Um, but secondly, um, you can easily have people come together, as happens in, in many industries, where people come together and they don't have the force of the law to require every newcomer to, to sign on with their certification, but they within their profession can certify that, you know, this is, you know, the, the American Barbers Association certified, you know, barbershop, right? So there's a, a standard of quality that people have to meet if they want to join, but they can still start up on their own without that. Um, that's a way to regulate a market. It, it's a signal for buyers when, when they're going to find a product. They say, oh, you know, I trust the American Barbers Association or whatever made up, uh, you know, board we want to, we want to think of. Um, that, that signals to me that, yeah, that's what I want. Other people, they'd say, oh, no, you know, my friend down the street, he can cut my hair better. You know, whatever. And people still do it in their home. But, uh, but again, it should be something that is a stepping stone to something greater instead of, you know, something that you can only kind of do in this, this really black market way these days. So uh, that's just a tiny example, but I think that's worth thinking about, that there's not enough creative entrepreneurial thinking when it comes to regulation. If we care about the environment, we care about health, um, all those sorts of things, our first and only answer does not have to be the state. Yeah, I think uh, this is a case where I don't quite realize my own privilege in some of these things, because I have yet to meet the barber who can screw up my haircut. <laughs> so. Whether they're certified or not, I don't know if it matters. Yeah. John, you had something you wanted to add. So here are some thoughts for sound regulatory design. The most important
principle is that things can evolve, that regulations can evolve with society, the economy, and technology. So when there's an issue or a problem, of course, our natural first reaction is there's got to be a law, there's got to be a regulation. No, push back on that. That should not be our first natural impulse, although it usually is. What should be? The first natural impulse was, if you two folks can't resolve the issue yourselves, then uh, take it to a court of law and let the judge or, if appropriate, jury decide uh, what the best resolution is for that concern. Uh, after we have a number of those cases, so we can see a clear pattern in how they're being resolved in that jurisdiction in that society. Great, then we, that builds our confidence that we can make a rule, a statute, if there's a consistent pattern there. If not, then we might want to wait until we see a consistent pattern. Or if there are two distinct cases, maybe we reflect those distinct cases in a statute. And then that statute should have a limited lifetime, three years, five years, so that it automatic things change, society changes, technology, economies, let it automatically expire at the end of some period of time so that it has to be renewed after that, uh, deliberately by the uh, body, the parliament, whoever. Uh, limit the number of words and pages. If there are more than certainly a hundred pages, people are not going to read it, they're not going to be able to comprehend all of the implications of it and all of its unintended consequences. Also, it's a great opportunity for people to sneak in uh, things that benefit a particular special interest group, which we don't want. And uh, so, uh, limit the number of pages, have sunset clauses, and, uh, and those are a few thoughts. As an editor, I second uh, word and page limits on, on laws, and on everything, really. If, if there's a way to apply the regulation to a limited geographical area, so we can do an A-B test after some period of time to see what the effects were in that area versus what were the effects in the area that did not have the regulation. In other words, do a real natural experiment. That's ideal also. We've got about five minutes left, uh, so I want to close with a related question to, to each of you. Um, so as we noted, John, you approach this as an entrepreneurial practitioner. Uh, Dylan, you approach these questions from an academic standpoint. So uh, John, for you, if you have a budding entrepreneur who approaches you and wants one really good piece of advice about pursuing an, an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor, What's that piece of advice that you would give them? And then for Dylan, what's one thing that you think that person should understand about kind of the academic view of entrepreneurship that would benefit them as well? John, we'll start with you. I started my first company with a really cool technology for which there was no market need. And it took me six to nine months to let go of that idea and replace it for something for which there was a real market need, namely the ability to do surveys on the internet. This is back in the early 90s. That product, Decisive Survey, became a hit, and the company is part of Google today. So it really does work. Start with uh, the real unsatisfied customer need, and that way you'll know that you really are addressing a customer need. It's especially for engineering folks like me, it's so easy to get enamored with a technology, uh, a solution, and then try to force fit that solution to a customer need or invent a customer need when there isn't one. Start with a customer need and you may find that it doesn't even need that cool technology that you had in mind. There might be a much easier direct way, more direct way to address it. So, Theorists study entrepreneurship because they are not good at doing it. Because <laughs> if, if you could start a business and be successful, um, 
you would do that instead of studying how people do it. Um, so I, I, I would say start by saying that the people who study entrepreneurship uh, are doing so more for the non-entrepreneurs. And that's very important, actually. It gets into everything we've been talking about in terms of uh, you know, the structure of a market, what opportunities are available, what regulations are there, what barriers are in the way. Um, and having that understanding for the general public and especially for policymakers is incredibly important. So there, there's a role to play there. Um, that said, uh, now I will borrow from my wife. Uh, she, every time she meets an economist, uh, she says, what is the one thing that you wish uh, entrepreneurs knew about economics? Um, and the best answer uh, she got, actually from my PhD supervisor, uh, Philip Booth, uh, was uh, about reducing transaction costs. Um, and John already mentioned this in terms of uh, the changes in operation systems from DOS to, to the Macintosh um, and then to Windows and that sort of thing. And we, you know, we could get into all sorts of um, areas in which that applies. But any way you can do things in a more efficient manner. You know, or you mentioned uh, contractors, how they allow you to really outsource whole portions of a business nowadays. They, they make, they've made entrepreneurship easier. Um, so ways in which you can reduce those transaction costs make you know, your good idea that seemed impossible now suddenly possible. Can we have a round of applause for John Chisholm, Dylan Palman for our last panel today. Great, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the Free Market Roadshow Grand Rapids. Uh, a couple of notes before we go. First of all, um, we have a bookshop set up over in the corner. Andy, wave at the nice people. That's Andy. Say hi to Andy. Hi, Andy. Uh, all kinds of great titles over there. Go over and take a look. Um, you know, there's probably something that you're going to want to leave with, so go check that out. Um, we also have on the back table there uh, copies of Religion and Liberty, the last three editions of Religion and Liberty, which is the magazine that we publish quarterly here at the Acton Institute. Please grab a copy of, the, of one of those before you head out as well. Um, and I want to know, in terms of upcoming events, uh, the next one upcoming event we have is in June. It's Acton University, uh, which is June 19th through 22nd, here in Grand Rapids over at DeVos Place. Uh, applications for that are open right now. If you go to university.acton.org, that's all the information that you need to know there about how to participate either in person here in Grand Rapids or participating through uh, Acton University online uh, as well. So I encourage you to go check that out. Uh, thank you again to our partners at the Free Market Roadshow for helping us put this on uh, for the Acton Institute. Thanks so much for being here. Have a great rest of your day.